Hello, everyone. If you are just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be Planning on Democracy, the Past and Future of Government Planning. I'd like to welcome Paul to the stage to begin our session. Welcome, Paul. Thanks, Callie. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Planning on Democracy. My name is Paul Healy. I'm a policy advisor with the Radical Exchange Foundation, and I'm really excited to introduce this session and our fantastic presenter, Alicia Holland. COVID-19 has exposed the challenges and importance of coordinating government policies. Historically, planning institutions played this key coordination role. They were seen as critical to thinking about long-term risks and policies, while voters and politicians focused on the short-term. But planning institutions rightly have been criticized as top-down and bureaucratic. This talk will look at the ambition of state planning institutions with a focus on their role in Latin America. It'll show how the response to COVID-19 has exposed many flaws in traditional notions of planning. Finally, it'll turn to the future, asking what participatory planning could look like, how citizens and governments can better coordinate to respond to challenges that COVID-19 will continue to raise, and what tools from the radical exchange movement can help create new democratic forms of planning for the long run. Alicia Holland is an associate professor in the government department at Harvard University. She studies the comparative political economy of development with a focus on Latin America. Her first book, Forbearance as Redistribution, The Politics of Informal Welfare in Latin America, published in 2017, examines the politics of law enforcement against the poor. She's working on a new book on the institutional determinants and challenges of large scale infrastructure projects. With that, I'm gonna kick it over to Alicia. Um, she'll speak for about 30 minutes and we'll have a, plenty of time for audience Q&A. So please don't be shy with those questions on, on Slido. Alicia. Great, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you to everyone for being here today. Um, so I really want to use this as a broad brainstorming session to think about the role of planning um, and also the types of mechanisms that radical exchange can bring to the planning process. Um, and I think planning is a really interesting space to start thinking about kind of radical innovation, um, in part because it's one of the hardest tasks to really change and innovate in. Um, and I think many in that radical exchange movement might be skeptical about the idea of governments playing a large role in these processes. So what I wanna to do today is first start just talking about what planning is, um, some of the critiques of planning, um, and some of the reasons that I think planning is still fundamental to the workings of democracy. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about ideas that I have for how radical exchange ideas can be brought into planning, um, but I also look forward to a broad conversation about what planning might look like. Um, so first, let's just start with the idea of, you know, what is government planning? Um, definitions of planning are often so capacious and vague that they're unhelpful. So planning can just be the process of setting priorities. Um, and government planning is often just about, you know, deciding what needs to be done in sort of a medium or long run time horizon. Um, and then also how to get there. What are the specific sort of investment projects or policies that a government's going to use to implement its um, now, you can get a little more concrete in thinking about, you know, specific areas where planning is really fundamental. So one of the most traditional areas of planning was actually population planning and sort of broad societal planning projects. Um, in the social sciences, these are often talked about as legibility projects. So you can think about the census as being the sort of key instrument of government planning. Governments needed to know where people were, how population growth was changing, and therefore how to allocate resources. That's one type of planning that occurs within states. Um, another major debate around planning has to do with urban planning. Cities are incredibly dense and complex, um, and for good reason, that density produces a need for government structured plans about how cities are gonna grow and change. Um, and cope with the sort of expanding populations that they might be facing. Um, I put up a picture of Brasilia because radical exchange initially was supposed to be in Brazil and a lot of people associate kind of failed ideas of urban planning with Brasilia, this sort of high modernist experiment to actually lay out the city in a very specific grid form with different functions um, confined to different parts of the city. It was an ambitious attempt to um, imagine the city form from the top down and create a new city that would be ordered from the get-go. 
So this was at a period where city planners were in ascendance and the sense was that planners could really think through a, a, a better functioning city. Um, Third type of planning that has historically been extremely important, especially when you start talking about um, the developing world is industrial planning or development planning. So particularly for countries that have been trying to develop after much of the industrial world um, already had, had experienced rapid economic growth. The idea was that you needed central government planning institutions that were gonna come up with um, you know, investments that could kickstart growth and also could coordinate the economy. So if a government was going to invest in a railway, then they also wanted to invest in agricultural products that would be right along the rail lines um, to maximize the impact of both of those government investments. So especially in the, you know, post-World War II period, there was a revival of interest in industrial planning and using the tools of government investment um, and also government running industries as a way to jumpstart growth. And much of those plans were designed by planning boards or planning agencies. In many cases, these were military planners. So planning sometimes is associated with authoritarian governments um, that have often ambition to have these kind of broad economic transformations. Finally, in the more contemporary period, you might think about planning having much more to do with high risk, um, low probability event, or sorry, to large risks um, to the state. So um, obviously COVID-19 has a lot of people thinking about pandemic and sort of global health planning. Also climate change has many people interested in sort of long run environmental and climate planning. So these are all different areas that in some ways pose very distinct problems of how to structure states and how to come to collective decisions. But many of the critiques of planning run across these areas. Um, and so what I briefly want to lay out for you is the kind of ways in which planning has lost favor um, and money governments have stepped away from these kind of broad ambitions to engage in government planning. Um, so, and a lot of this comes from the question of, you know, can government planning really be democratic? Um, and so what I mean by that are really three different things. Um, so the first is a criticism that when we talk about government or state planning, it's often with this inflection that, you know, the planner is a bureaucrat, probably in the capital city of a country, um, often detached from the population and the problems that um, they're thinking about. Um, and so you get these sort of centralized bureaucracies, often motivated by ideological visions. Sometimes, you know, in the case of urban planning in Brazil, I was talking about it was these high modernist ideas about imposing order on the urban form. In other cases, it's been technocratic expertise. So the idea that, you know, a bureaucrat knows better how to do a climate risk assessment than somebody, you know, an ordinary citizen would in their community. Um, and perhaps the most famous book in this spirit was by James Scott, who wrote um, Seeing, by the, Seeing Like a State, which was trying to weave together all of these different projects of kind of centralized bureaucrats to provide sort of a scientific rationale to what was going to what was happening in society and also to project what then would happen in response to government intervention. Um, and all of this came from a similar hubris that bureaucrats could predict sort of a scientific reaction of the population to government planning schemes. So Scott really points out that what was lost across these areas, whether they were industrial modernization schemes or urban planning schemes, or if we think about kind of climate change plans today, is that many of them are very detached from local communities and they're missing what he called the local metis or the sort of input that you get from having people on the ground affected by policies directly participating in the formulation of government plans. Um, so one thrust of a critique of planning is that it's simply, it's too centralized. It is run by bureaucrats and technocrats and misses the action of local 
Now, a second type of critique is somewhat different. So it accepts that, well, perhaps plans can be formulated in a more democratic way. You can have bureaucrats, you know, involved in discussions on the ground with citizens and getting local input, but there's still a real problem with planning. And that's the fact that planning often ambitions to take place at a sort of medium or long time horizon. So the goal of planning is really to help extend time horizons and help governments think about broader agendas that are going to transcend um, multiple election periods. But this runs into a real tension with electoral democracy. So most politicians are elected on campaign platforms that propose policies for, you know, maybe it's just four years or eight years or 10 years or whatever, but they don't want to be bound by the plans of their predecessors. And in a certain sense, their electoral mandate means they shouldn't necessarily have to follow a set of policies that a different government designed. And so one critique of planning is that it doesn't actually bind governments because each new politician is going to want to impose a new plan. And at a certain level, planning, if it just becomes an electoral platform, no longer has its main purpose, which is really to extend the time horizons and extend the scope of the state beyond a particular electoral period. So there's this real tension between representative democracy and planning, even if it's done with some sort of participatory input. Now, a third issue is that, you know, to the extent we think of democracy as more than the sort of electoral rules of the game, we might care that, you know, democracy involves kind of citizens having equal voice and equal input or some more substantive definition of democracy. And like many other policies, um, planning is often criticized because more powerful, educated citizens and often special interest groups can easily dominate the planning process. Um, and you see this critique arise in a lot of attempts to implement participatory planning of different forms. So again, thinking of the Brazilian case, Brazil has been a leader in implementing participatory budgeting. But many of the studies that have come out of that process show that it's often better educated citizens who are actually taking part in those participatory processes. Similar and very powerful critiques have happened of urban planning in the United States. So there's excellent recent work showing that, you know, even as urban planning has tried to um, allow for more citizen input, the citizens who choose to participate are often participating with very particular interests in mind. So for example, um, Jessica Traunstein shows in a book called Segregation by Design that a lot of racial segregation in the US has persisted because local zoning ordinances often set through town meetings and open board discussions um, often have perpetuated segregating practices um, and tried to boost home prices and reduce the construction of affordable housing rather than creating more integrated communities. Um, so we might be very worried that even if we inflect planning with more democratic participation, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to end up with substantive representation of different interests. Um, and it might be particularly vulnerable to the capture by certain interest groups and certain interests with more power. Um, I should say that in the region that I study, another critique of planning is that it's um, is more participatory planning is that it's also open to extreme political um, polarization and political manipulation. So many participatory planning processes have been promoted by left wing populist governments who then often only recruit the participation of a certain segment of the population who are aligned with that political so there are many common critiques of the planning process, even when it is more participatory, um, that it doesn't necessarily allow for equal participation um, across partisan lines, class lines, and racial lines. Now, even with these critiques, what I want to emphasize today is that planning is central to democracy. Um, and it's central to confronting some of the real shortcomings of electoral democracy. 
they're saying. Um, so this might already be clear from some of what I've discussed already, but one of the challenges in electoral democracy is that politicians are myopic. So they often have short time horizons that coincide with a single electoral period. And that means that it's very hard to encourage politicians to invest in policies with long run benefits um, and also to take preventative measures to reduce risks. Um, so studies show that, you know, there, there certainly are interventions that, you know, the United States could have invested in to reduce its vulnerability to a global pandemic. But the electoral rewards for taking, making those investments that are only realized in the future are very low. And so one thing that planning in its various forms might do is really try to extend the electoral time horizons and think about kind of longer state goals. Now, the second, and this might seem in tension with the sort of critique that I just gave of planning, is that planning actually can be a device to prevent special interest group capture. Um, so many governments have rejected the idea of more centralized long run planning. And they face sort of the opposite issue of what I just talked about, which is that the agenda is so open that special interest groups often have a very easy time putting policies or investments, um, proposing them to politicians and therefore really setting the agenda much more powerfully than they might in the presence of a government plan. And let me just give one example of what this might look like. So I've been writing a lot about transportation investments, which might seem like a very niche topic, but um, very central to how urban development and urban planning works. Um, and in the 1990s, many Latin American governments eliminated the idea of setting a central transportation plan or even having an urban plan for the city. So Lima has no central urban plan. Um, the Peruvian Ministry of Transportation has very loose ideas about what it wants to build in the future. Um, and what this allowed um, infrastructure construction groups to do is basically propose projects that they found profitable. Um, so in a giant scandal that broke out around the Brazilian construction firm Odebrecht, um, it was found that Odebrecht actually proposed to the Peruvian government to build this $2 billion highway through the Amazon. Um, and that project advanced onto the political agenda in part because there was no actual plan for what else should be done. So there wasn't a set of clear priorities about highways or urban investments that might be a better use of money. And it also meant that civil society groups or regional interests that didn't want this giant highway through the Amazon being built didn't really have a way to push against the project. They couldn't see that spending money on the highway through the Amazon would mean that there wouldn't be a budget available to build a subway or to invest in other policies. So planning, you can think of as a sort of disciplining device, which shows what the government priorities are, and therefore can create stakeholders to defend different policies against special interest groups, in this case, construction industry, the construction industry, but you can imagine this playing out in many other scenarios. Um, a third reason that I think planning is central to democracy and central to the discussions being had about radical exchange is that planning helps to broker spatial compromises. So one of the big questions is at what level of government should discussions like, you know, how you would use QV or how you would hold a participatory planning meeting actually happen? Now, most kind of participatory planning processes are very local. They're about having, you know, a local community decide on how to use their budget. But one hard task is then figuring out how to actually scale up those collective decision making processes and broker compromises across geographic units. So if you take the sort of infrastructure example that I was thinking about, um, you can imagine that every community would vote against being the site for a landfill or being the site for a hydroelectric dam. But 
landfills and dams are central to some notions of economic development and social welfare. So when it comes to actually citing those projects and deciding how to balance the interests of a local community that's going to suffer a concentrated harm and national well-being, planning institutions are often central to those conversations. Um, so somehow we need a device that's able to scale up local decision making processes and think about projects that have broader geographic scope as well as temporal scope. Lastly, a key idea behind planning, especially in the 1960s, when it was at its sort of height of this high modernist planning moment, was the idea of coordination. Um, so you can think about planning in each of the areas that we talked about, and you can think about government policies being designed around particular topics with a long run focus. But a core challenge of government, and something that I think COVID-19 has really exposed in many countries, is the need to coordinate different arms of government. So one ambition of central planning, um, not in the sort of socialist sense, but in the sense of coordinating many government um, agencies, really is to make sure that government investments and policies speak to each other. Um, and this is central to the idea that public investments can actually have increasing social returns. So when the government decides to invest in, say, a railroad and then makes a complementary investment in, you know, agricultural technology that's right beside the railroad, those investments are going to do far more than if they were made in isolation. Likewise, you can think of governments that have, you know, bought the reagents to do testing for COVID, but didn't actually buy the swabs. Those are useless investments. And somehow you need to have a coordination device within the government that is able to make sure that what each agency is doing or what each arm of an agency is doing actually is coordinated with the investments of others. So those are some of the reasons that we think planning is still central to democratic systems and that planning agencies still might be important institutions to think about building up. So what's the sort of radical future of planning? How does this actually intersect with radical exchange? Um, this is really what I want to talk about today and what I think would be great to get different ideas on. Um, so the first idea really has to do with how you actually implement something like quadratic voting on the ground. Um, quadratic voting in a lot of ways solves some of these issues around, you know, balancing tyranny of the majority with actual intense minority preferences. It can even be thought of as potentially a device to help us think about brokering spatial compromises across different groups. Um, but one of the key questions about using something like quadratic voting is how to determine the initial list of sort of projects or policies that people are even voting on. Um, and this becomes even more complicated when you think about quadratic voting being used across many decision points, so over time. Um, and so planning in a certain sense, one of its ambitions is to set the agenda, is to make clear what the sort of priorities are over time and then have people think about how to rank those priorities. But in its traditional conception, it's a very bureaucratic process. So I'll just give you an example from my own research. I've used quadratic voting as a way to think about how cities prioritize different transportation investment projects. But in picking that list of projects, I relied on government plans as determining the list of projects that people were even going to vote over. Now, that's a very bureaucratic, centralized process. Maybe there's a way to inject even more of the radical exchange ideas into planning by thinking that there needs to be an initial quadratic voting kind of system to determine the list of projects that itself are then going to be the agenda for our next electoral period. And for those of you who are at Audrey Tang's talk, there's also amazing software being used in Taiwan to think about how to have initial deliberative decisions that then set the plan um, or that then set the sort of policy proposals that could be then subject to kind of quadratic voting or some other more democratic means of collective decision. 
So the first question is, how do we set the plan? How do we set the agenda in a more democratic way? And how could quadratic voting be part of that or other kind of radical exchange mechanisms? A second piece is how you actually get citizens to participate more in the design of projects or policies. So this goes back to the old critique. You want local input. You need people who have everyday knowledge of the world to actually participate actively in government policy. Um, but most people actually don't have the time to do that. So participation becomes really uneven and self-interested in most cases. It's possible to imagine quadratic finance being part of the solution. So matching funds to kind of individual contributions could be a way to start developing projects that come from different sources and that avoid some of the special interest capture. Again, I think this is a very open question, but I think a core problem in thinking about what planning is, is where the projects come from, where the government's proposals come from. And so maybe there's a way to finance different types of proposal development that could help prevent some of these issues of capture that I've talked about today. And the last thing is something that I think um, isn't yet actually a mechanism or a practical policy proposal, but I think is central to the issues of planning overall, which is how you think about designing policies and designing long term plans in a democratic spirit. Um, there are going to be several talks over the course of radical exchange thinking about the problems of technocracy. And I think that technocracy um, really is at the center of what planning has become in many countries and in many areas. Um, and that can extend from, you know, transportation experts coming up with, you know, what seems like their optimized transportation plan. It could be in the case of, you know, climate change and putting scientists in charge of what the risk analysis should be about where people should be building. Obviously, expertise is a central part of government planning and thinking about risks and long run probabilities is a really hard act. But nonetheless, we need to think about ways in which those experts can communicate in a democratic spirit. And to make these decisions truly participatory, I think we are going to need to think about expertise being shared in a way that that really can be digested by a larger fraction of the population so that people don't actually defer to that expertise, but are able to question and think about different priorities and think about different features. So those are the three topics that I'd love to talk about in a broader conversation. And today was really just meant to be a sort of introduction to some of the ideas about planning and some of the problems that I think um, are right for social innovation and are right for radical exchange ideas. Thanks so much, Alicia. This is, I mean, this has just been incredible and really, really thought provoking. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and tee up some of the audience questions for you. Um, so we have we have three questions um, from the audience, and if if you're watching and listening, please um, you know fire away if you have any others that come to mind. Um, so here's here's the first one from Divya. Um, this is the the most popular audience question at the moment. How do we concretely balance decentralization and coordination, i.e., which things fall to planning or democratic participation, and how do we intersect those? So maybe you know it's 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 obviously it's it's a tough one, but maybe if you can kind of more concretely walk through how to you know, think about these trade-offs. Yeah, um, I mean, that's, I think it, it's at the heart of this tension. Um, and I don't think that there is an easy answer. Um, I mean, I think that it also gets to this question of can you talk about planning in sort of a broad sense or do we need to actually get to a concrete policy area? So if I think about, you know, urban planning, you know, obviously there is a role for coordination um, in the sense that you you do need kind of some centralized authority, in my opinion, who's able to see the sort of different investments that a city is making and also to kind of even just take in the sort of different decisions that are happening at a decentralized level. So you can't imagine that, you know, every local community within a city is going to set its transportation plan not thinking of what other communities are going to do because there are spatial spillovers to those decisions and like you can think of the sort of classic problems of you know railroads it's like if france builds its railroad with one gauge and spain builds its railroad with another gauge like that's absolutely useless so of course coordination is far more important in that context than decentralized input because 
if French industry wanted one gauge and Spanish industry wanted a different gauge, like we shouldn't be bowing to those preferences. We shouldn't be giving input in that context where clearly the gains from coordination are much larger than a sort of individual preference over railroad gauge. So that's an extreme example in the coordination direction, but obviously we can get examples that would fall in the other direction. So there are other cases where sort of the vision of a coordinating authority is going to miss kind of key local heterogeneity and key input. Now, where do we strike that balance? I think, I, I think that's the hardest question to really raise and it requires deep thinking about sort of what are the gains of coordination in different policy areas. Um, and also, you know, it goes back to, I think this question about communication, like, are there really ways in which, you know, um, increasing kind of deliberative democracy, increasing the way we're communicating about these issues could help decentralized participation come to a coordinated response. So like if you explain to French and Spanish citizens, like if you build on different gauges, you can't go visit the other country. I think like most citizens would understand the issue and explain in simple terms. So in some ways, decentralization can only advance as far as our communication skills can really, um, you know, push the debates so that you can arrive at those coordinating gains through actual discussion as opposed to an expert who's able to adjudicate different interests. I um, hope that started to answer the question, even though it's a, it's a big hard one. Yeah, thanks very much. And then um, I might just add uh, my own sort of follow up on this question, which is just on a question that was on my mind as well as you're presenting is, might there be a way to sort of categorize ex ante, like the substance of the decision being made? So for instance, uh, you, you, to take your urban planning transportation sort of example, when I think about like, you know, planning a bus system, we might want to say, well, the part of this that is like spending on bus maintenance, we just don't want to have maybe a democratic process because everyone's going to be kind of present biased but like the part of this that is selecting like where the bus route should go to serve people's commutes we want like a lot of democratic participation so we might have like a sort of a sliding scale where we can decide uh and i think obviously your point about like keeping pace with people's information is, is a good one but at a certain point probably just present bias would make it so hard for like any democratic process to get us the right amount of like maintenance spending right mm -hmm. yeah i think that's right and i think that um you know the question is who also makes the decision about like, what is the ex ante rule? Like, can we yeah. have a democratic debate to think about what those spheres are? Like, I guess I put a lot of faith in this idea of like much more radical communication and sort of like people might, people largely will understand like there are spheres that like, I don't wanna be part of where I think like, you know, having some rule that also, you know, potentially locks in sort of, you know, different spheres where like, okay, we're just gonna have a plan that like this much is on maintenance spending and like that can't be touched by these other democratic spheres. Like that yeah. in a certain sense makes sense, but that still requires some discussion to like lock in the spheres that are gonna be turned over um, and probably, uh, at some frequency, renewing those decisions and renewing those debates of like whether those actually are spheres that can be kind of locked off and sort of treated mm -hmm. as not part of the like broader democratic decision making process. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, it's not exactly obvious um, ex ante. Uh, so moving on to our next question. And uh, th this question makes me very happy since I'm, I'm currently a law student. So the question from Anonymous is, how does law fit into this picture? Are legal or constitutional norms plans? Mm. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, so I think that in a lot of ways you can think of constitutions and especially countries that have more recent consti like constitutional processes as like the social compact and the overarching plan. Um, and so like I do a lot of work in Colombia, which rewrote its constitution in 1991 and, you know, building off Paul's last question, you know, some of the things that were baked into the constitution were ideas like, you know, the social investment budget never could decrease, right? And so like that was just 
a principle that like could not be touched and in some way that was to guard against a lot of politicians who, you know, come an economic crisis would say like, oh, I'm going to gut the pension system or I'm not going to invest in healthcare in this given year. And so like that was in a certain sense, like the, the strongest disciplining device that allowed or that set the terms around what all other sort of planning you know, would be like for the common year. So in a certain sense, I think constitutions are the overarching kind of highest level plan in most countries. Um, you know, moving down from the constitution, like should we think of laws as plans? Um, I think I'm using planning in a slightly different sense, even though, you know, laws implement aspects of plans but to me plans like when we go from the constitution the next step i think is often some kind of broader national plan um which then will have laws articulated around it um but you know i think in many countries the kind of a development plan or a social plan um has ambition that the principles that go beyond a specific law in a specific policy area now, obviously, if we move to something, you know, more specific, maybe there are laws that like end up looking like plans. Um, I, off the top of my head, I don't have great examples like that, but I guess it depends on, you know, the specific legislation or law that we'd be talking about. But I personally think of planning as something broader than an individual law. It is setting the principles and priorities um, that sort of transcend what we might think of as a single law. Thanks. Um, and then if I might chime in with my, uh, what little expertise I have as a law student here, I, I think there's a, there are a lot of important ways that the law sort of shapes planning. And in particular, like in addition to what you said, Alicia, about the substance of plans, like this budget can't go down, you know, can't change by a certain amount. The, like laws, I think, put really important guardrails on the process of planning. So a really, a, a really salient example that comes to mind is um, for those of us based in the U.S., the uh, really important Supreme Court decision yesterday about DACA, mm -hmm. that, is a, that was a case about the field of administrative law, which puts mm -hmm. rules around how all our government agencies can actually make plans. And so the case was about the improper way in which um, the, the federal government rescinded the DACA program, not about like anything to do with immigration law per se. So, so that, that whole field of administrative law just says when the government, when, when all these agencies make plans, they have to, you know, take comments, they have to consider a certain menu of options, they have to give reasons to the public about, and, and then, you know, cost benefit analysis, right? Like we discount the future by a certain amount and we look at certain costs and benefits and, you know, and, and so there, I think there, you know, this is a very like overlooked area of law, I think, um, is that yeah. if you could change, you tweak the way that executive agencies make their plans, you could really change kind of distributional outcomes. And so, so that's, that's, that's kind of the, the brief thing I would add there. Um, yeah. No, I think that's really right. And I think, you know, as, as you say that, it is true that there's, a, there's also a debate about whether plans should be laws. So for example, Colombia in the late 90s decided to make each development plan binding as a law. So like you can't, and what I was talking about is sort of plans as a disciplining device. Like that's an example where, you know, you can't actually add in a project that isn't part of the development plan. And so that is one way to see it as, you know, a binding law. But I also think that Paul's mm -hmm. point is totally true that like laws are the guardrails and they are the ways that, you know, planning itself gets shaped and the contours of those discussions um, are shaped depending on the substantive area. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now our next uh, most popular question from the audience is from Matt. It seems like some plans are more political or politicized than others. Is there a way of teasing out um, to see which uh, to, to make to make a distinction between the apolitical, non-polarizing plans versus versus the ones that are more political? Yeah. So, I mean. So of course, like when we start talking about, you know, constitutions and national plans, like to me, those are the ones where we want the broadest, most vibrant political debate because they are about principles that I think, you know, if communicated properly, like all citizens can understand, we want different sectoral interests involved in. And like, I think one of the problems and the sort of stressing that common critique of centralization is like that these plans were done in such a sort of technocratic divorced way so like to me that is it is the most political plan when you start talking about like 
planning closer to being like, what should our social contract look like, right? Um, in some countries, that is what national planning is about. Um, it is about coming up with broad principles that are very politicized and should be very politicized. Obviously, then we move to the realm of like a zoning plan or even a transportation plan, like it's less overtly political. I still think that there's a responsibility on the part of technocrats to make those plans more comprehensible and to make their political consequences clear. So, you know, social scientists understand that like zoning plans have a huge consequence on segregation and racial relations and wealth inequalities and a host of factors that are political and that people do care about. But those discussions are often done in a way that like it becomes about like should the zoning board permit that you know 10 feet from the curb like you know they're they're ridiculously um small and technical rules that don't make their consequences clear so like yes it is less political but i also think that there is a responsibility on the part of experts to make the consequences and to imagine the consequences in a way that that can be concrete um, and that can be part of the Discussion. Great, thanks. Um, so moving on, we have another another great question. Um, this is I'm, I, this is a bit of a general question, and I'm going to sort of tag on my own more specific follow up, and so you can kind of tackle both both parts. So the question is, how do you ensure voter participation as the interval between democratic decisions shrinks? Uh, and the volume of decisions explodes. And so I, I think the person means sort of like the decisions are really frequent. Um, and so, you know, how, as you talk about empowering um, voice, how, how do you think about that um, sort of burden, I guess you're putting on citizens? Uh, and then like my, my more specific follow-up is on this topic, one thing that I'm sort of interested in is like sortition mechanisms. So should we have like a jury duty, random selection for things like planning decisions or, you know, to, to kind of, um, uh, uh, conquer the sort of unequal voice problems that you mentioned. And so I uh, love your thoughts on, on that set of things. Yeah, those are both great questions. Um, so I think imagining a world in which say quadratic voting decisions were these kind of frequent referenda on different issues or, you know, a, a ballot of different decisions at once. Um, you know, part of the idea of trying to think about structuring decisions around quadratic voting is that also like, you don't necessarily have to spend your votes on things that you don't care about. And in a certain sense, like we already have that and that like, you don't have to show up on election day for issues you don't care about or for races you don't care about. There's always a question of like, should that be obligatory? Should we be promoting greater civic duties? Should people have to like, at least put their votes on something in a quadratic voting world? and I don't know that I want to wade into that, but I would say that, you know, there's a trade off between building civic responsibility and having people form the habits of participating regularly and having politics be part of their lives and the sort of cognitive and, you know, um, substantive burdens you put on people for having to participate in decisions. I think quadratic voting and letting people sort of put more voice and put more weight on issues that they care about and pay attention to is meant to reconcile some of that tension as opposed to a system where like you're required to come to every single referendum, um, you know, on a policy issue. Um, and so, so that is one way to kind of balance those, but it's a fundamental democratic trade off. Oh. I think we have Danny. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, and then to get to your question, Paul, I mean, I think that, you know, the way to break the sort of technocratic expertise that you're talking about is to think about having some sort of, you know, random civic duty to participate in these spheres. Um, I think that one of the hard parts is like, do you select citizens totally at random or do you think that there's more of a responsibility to maybe have a representative for different sectors who are then potentially selected at random so for example like in in planning like i think it's really important to have different um you know industries represented workers as well as corporations represented but i don't know and I don't think we know empirically, like, would you get a quote unquote better result or a better conversation thinking about having kind of representatives from different sectors and reserve seats versus kind of a full random selection of the 
population. There are areas, and this is going back to Matt's question, that require so much expertise that even the discussions, if you have a combination of experts and randomly selected citizens, the experts are gonna so dominate the conversation that honestly, like it's kind of purposeless to have put people without the sort of technical knowledge to, or even principles to sort of defend themselves on those issues. So I like the ideas of sort of broadening participation, but having kind of maybe some selection rules that would create a kind of structured conversation with different Awesome. Thanks. Yeah, that's really um, that's really interesting stuff. I, I really like where you went at the end there about kind of selection rules to make the random process like more tailored to the problem. I think that's really important. Um, so I think we have about five minutes, probably time for one one more question, maybe two. Um, this is a this is this is this is a good one. I think a, a pretty provocative question um, from anonymous with current data availability and a large research community. Should planning be done by government agencies or can it be outsourced? Uh, so I guess the question is outsourced to who um, and sort of what that looks like. So, um, you know, I, I work a lot in Latin America where in the 1990s, very influenced by kind of new managerialism and the idea that, you know, the expertise doesn't need to be in the state. We can turn to, you know, hiring consultants in particular areas to kind of do the work um, and to actually provide you know you know better insight into a given area um, i think that process has been a bit of a disaster in latin america um, part of it is that there's no such thing as objective expertise um, and so what i see happening across the developing world is that you know politicians hire their favorite consultant to do the study that then shows that like the pet project that they love should be done um, and I think that's, that's a huge problem of how you can think about sort of, um, you know, outsourcing to, if, if the idea is hiring kind of consultants to do this work, like how, how does that become embedded in a democratic process? Um, and so I, I'm worried about that. I think that there is something about, you know, creating, um, a, a public sector that has, you know, um, principles that transcend partisanship and that has seen processes take place across multiple political cycles. So at the end of the day, like I am a believer in state bureaucracy as um, hopefully cultivating some, some broader set of principles and also being able to um, you know, be whistleblowers and defend against um, what 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 they see as potentially cases of special interest capture or politicians manipulating the process. So I, I'm skeptical about the ability to outsource some of these things. Um, but on the other hand, I am very optimistic about the ability of better data and new technology to open up the process of deliberation so that these aren't bureaucrats just kind of, you know, sitting in Washington, D.C. or Lima, Peru, making decisions. But I think that the example of Taiwan, really having this be part of a constant conversation in which big data is used to inform and check the choices of public officials um, is closer to the future than I imagine. Great, thanks. Well, we're, we're nearing the end of our time here. So just want to thank you so much, Alicia, for joining us today um, and, and giving this really, really provocative uh, and an interesting presentation. It's a bit anticlimactic right now because I can't ask everyone to, you know, give a great standing ovation for you. Um, but I, I also want to thank everyone who did tune in and um, send in such, such great questions. So this this was a really um, an awesome discussion. So thank you so much, Alicia. Well, thank you, Paul, and thank you to everybody who who came and asked questions. Thanks, everyone. Bye.